Well, guys, um, it's a little after five. You're here. I'm here. Let's get started. Um, where we left off last week, or excuse me, Monday. Um, I got to tell you something, and that is that I don't have the video recording of that class. I lost a file somewhere. Uh, it's not on YouTube. I, it's not on Zoom. Maybe I didn't record it. So anyway, I know this one's being recorded and I'll post it uh, sometime tonight or tomorrow morning. So picking up where we left off, we were talking about global art worldwide and we talked about a number of the subjects, strategies, concerns of artists in this day and age. And of course, I can't really count that as this day and age. This is 30 something years old. But let me tell you about Keith Herring. Another one of our artists who died at a young age a contemporary of Jean-Michel Basquiat. And he too was a graffiti artist. And as I told you about what was happening in the 1980s and galleries and art critics and collectors and a lot of people involved with the arts were looking for what you might call new voices. I think the same thing was happening in music at the same time. We see the emergence of hip hop, for example. A new kind of music kind of comes up from the ground up. It's grassroots. It's authentic. It's new. It's original. And it defies some of the conventions that were laid out before. And so this is Keith Herring, and he was a graffiti artist, and he started off, he made these characters, and he'd go down in the New York subway and paint these figures just like this. He had his own vocabulary of figures, and they were, as you can see, cartoon-like. They were very simple, and in a lot of ways, they were very expressive. And today, you still see this imagery. It comes out in a lot of ways. You can buy t-shirts, Keith Herring uh, images. You, there, it's all over. He's truly uh, a phenomenal artist. And so this was towards the end of his life after he had reached a level of success and so he was commissioned to make this big bureau excuse me big mural in pisa italy that's the same town that has the leaning tower and so anyway yeah this is a uh, huge you can see it's like one two three three stories high it's the side of a building and you see they have here some plexiglass. So it doesn't have graffiti on top of the graffiti art, if you will. And you see a signature down here, Keith Herring. And there's a documentary on one of the streaming services I watched not too long ago. I think it was on Amazon, but it could have been Netflix. At any rate, talked about Keith Herring talked about his very short, very mercurial, very illustrious career where he gained a lot of fame and fortune and then boom, gone. And so anyway, Keith Herring, he came from the Midwest. His parents, they interviewed them and they said, well, you know, Keith, when he was a little boy, he liked to draw cartoons. That was his favorite thing. And you can see, he developed it. 
And so anyway, this is part of that graffiti movement that, that pushed towards authenticity, newness, new ways of expressing oneself. Now there's a part of this idea that's not really in the book, but it was part of the art history in the 80s and 90s for sure. As everybody was looking for new artists and new ways of expression, new visual experiences, not, not coming up through the ranks of the traditional, the New York School, the abstract painters, geometric abstraction, expressionism, all of those kinds of standard ways of making art, people were looking. They were looking outside the normal, usual places, and they were finding Basquiat and Heron, but they were also looking at a lot of artists who were not educated artists. And they took a look at this and called it, uh, some people call it primitive art, some people called it, uh, folk art, some people called it outsider art. Outsider because these artists were not trained, schooled, educated, practiced in the usual way that a, one would study art and work your way up. And so when they're pulling these guys out of the subways and, and they're not so nicer parts of town, outsider art was becoming a big thing, just saying. And the empire struck back. And what happened here? I got a dollar sign. Because there were a lot of people who went ahead and they were making money and they liked making money. And they made this kind of, they kind of brought this idea to the fore. The idea that art and artists were about money. And it always has been. What you say? What about art for art's sake and Van Gogh who died penniless? That's all true. But if you look at the overall history, a lot of these artists were famous and they were wealthy. They made a lot of money and the big money financed their work. That's why they worked for kings and queens, for popes and bishops, for wealthy people. And so anyway, it was a kind of thing, it was an 80s thing. Any of you seen the movie Wall Street? I'm taking that as a no. It was from 1987. It was a Oliver Stone film and it had Michael Douglas as the main character named Gordon Gecko, and Charlie Sheen was in that movie too as an upstart stockbroker. Gordon Gecko in this film has a line that became famous. The line is, greed is good. That was a phrase that resonated because in the 80s, that was kind of the zeitgeist, at least among many people, the idea of making money was good. Greed is good. Greed drives success. It makes people want to achieve success. What else? What's a better motivator than greed? It's a rhetorical question. And so anyway, you get Jeff Koons. And he comes into the scene, and this is titled Pink Panther from 1988, and it's three and a half feet high. 
and it's made of porcelain. And it looks a lot like something you might see at a truck stop or a gas station or something, any more place that would sell like this really cheap stuff, impulse buying. Pink Panther, it's in some ways, it was kind of what you would call kitschy, which means it's kind of common, mundane, banal, ordinary. And so this is what he started making. He would pull these things out of regular popular culture. It was kind of like pop art. And oftentimes Coons referred to Andy Warhol as an inspiration. And Andy Warhol was greedy too. As a matter of fact, Warhol made tons of money and hung out with rich people and all that stuff. So Jeff Koons comes around and he does this stuff that he actually starts to defy notions of taste. And he would do these things that would be kind of considered poor taste, bad taste, Pink Panther. It's got, as you can see, woman nails, polish, you know, a little pink ribbon in her hair. And you can see it's kind of not all that exact, kind of looks like a bobblehead that you'd get at a ball game, don't you think? I mean, it's really kind of like that stuff. You know, it's there. Nobody, at least at the time, would have considered it high art. But there he is, Jeff Coons. And he knew how to market his work. He uh, worked for the Metropolitan Museum and the Museum of Modern Art, and he talked about ways for the museums to raise money and stuff, and he promoted, this is kind of common now, membership in a museum, that was a new thing. Anyway, bottom line, Coons was in it for the money, and he was unapologetic. And let me show you this. Here he is in this porcelain, it's called Michael Jackson with bubbles. And this was before Michael Jackson uh, unfortunately passed away. But again, pop culture, ceramics, it looks more like, like I say, a bobblehead or something like a figurine more than, than a, a sculpture at least as we know it. There's Jeff Coons. Let me show you something else. Record prices. Here's one that, here's another one that Coons did. Uh, it's called Mylar Bunny. And it looks like a Mylar balloon, except it's made out of steel. And I'll see if I can get this link here, if it still works. Let me make sure I can, you're on the right screen here. There we go. This is an auction. This is an auction with uh, selling a Jeff Coons piece. Folks, it's the yes. I like that. 72 minutes. 73 million. 74 million, 75 million, 77 million. Yours it is, sir. 78 million, 80. Here it is at 80 million dollars. Gentleman has it here. At 80 million, you have it, sir. 80 million dollars. So, what does that do about actually? Um, about your idea, 80 million bucks. That was in 2019. That was just two years ago. 
And you can see Jeff Coons, he's not that old. He's a living artist. His stuff has been selling like that for a long time. Not surprised, surprised, upset. Mm, thinking, no response. Well, Jeff Kuhn set out to make money. He made art and he made art about these kind of common everyday sort of banal things and uh, he's been very successful in the idea there's uh this is another one of those i forgot i got the date on this another one of those bunnies he'd make multiples of these things too by the way 91.1 million that might be the same auction. They might have been doing that for euros. I don't know. Bottom line, another sign that the art world is untethered from reality. So what say you? And uh, let me get this slideshow going and get you on the slideshow. Can you see it? Part three. Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. Thank you, Brooke. So money. Money drives it all. And there were a lot of artists in the 90s, the 2000s, the teens, making all kinds of money. And they're in it for the money. And this guy here, Damien Hurst, he had a knack for a lot of this. Uh, this is called Hydra and Kali, which is really kind of an interesting idea, if you will. Uh, Kali being uh, goddess from um, Hindu culture, Asian culture, and the Hydra is from Greek mythology, but you know, nevertheless. Anyway, so he makes it that he did sculpture and stuff, but this is really what I wanted to show you. Hearst Diamond skull sells for 100 million. A diamond encrusted platinum skull by artist Damien Hurst had been sold to an investment group for the asking price of 100 million. And so what this is, these are real jewels. These are real diamonds. Um, and it's made of platinum and and Hearst calls himself a conceptual artist. And so the concept here being, if an artist has the ability to make something like this with all of the diamond encrusted platinum What makes it worth a hundred million? The fact that it's an, a sculpture by artist Damien Hurst? Or is it because you've got a whole bunch of platinum and, and precious jewels in it? Or is it both? And so anyway, there's a little phrase in there that says sold to an investment group. What's happened in the 1990s, 2000s and stuff, and forward, I should say, bottom line, 
is that a lot of this, what we would call blue chip art, became an investment. It was an investment property. And so an investment group bought this for the asking price of 100 million. But these guys were like hedge funders. They buy stuff, they hang on to it, and presumably it increases in value. And they got their money locked up. It's inflation proof, it's recession proof, it's part of the culture, it's historically significant. So it's a pretty good investment. And so it's kind of like that greed is good idea. And really, they're getting into the realm of how these things are sold is either you got to be independently like Bill Gates or uh, Mark Cuban or somebody like that, or you got to be an investment group where you pool together a lot of money from a lot of rich people and spend it for them to make it grow, invest in. And so that's what happens. Uh, and so there are other things going on here too. And this is gonna have something to do with the quiz I'm gonna ask you to write about. Marisol self-portrait looking at the Last Supper. And Marisol, uh, it's actually put this together. She was something of a cubist. She liked doing things that sort of are, that is reminiscent of cubism. A lot of these flat pieces of plywood and so on. But in a lot of ways, this is a sculpture about a painting. And basically, when Leonardo da Vinci painted The Last Supper, and he was not the only one to ever paint The Last Supper by, by any stretch, he kind of defined The Last Supper. And so everything that comes after that is compared to da Vinci. He set the standard. Everybody kind of uses that as the touchstone, as the standard. And so this is kind of what this is dealing with too. And it's kind of in some ways um, has some degree of fidelity, excuse me, with, uh, with da Vinci. Got these panels that kind of make it look like it's uh, got perspective lines and stuff and the archway over the Christ figure, a lot of things, but it's really very different too. So this becomes a self-portrait with the artist herself looking at the Last Supper. And so a lot of art starts to be art that references art. Art about art. Here's another one of my favorites. This is in the book, Mark Tanzi, A Short History of Modernist Painting, 1982. And so, what the heck? Modernist painting. Well, we've been looking at a lot of modernist painting what do you think this is about? Does it look like Picasso? Does it look like Mondrian? Pollock or Rothko? Hmm. Well, let me explain. This is, these three things are, are metaphors. And really, modern art dealt a lot in metaphor. 
So an artist like Mondrian, who did uh, red, blue, and yellow squares on a white ground with uh, horizontal and vertical black lines. Well, he talked about his work as being about order and sanity and uh, the rules of, of life, of physics, and everything governed by a set of rules. And Jackson Pollock, dripping the paint all over the place, an expression of the inner self. It's a metaphor for what's going on in his heart, in his mind. And so, here's some wet metaphors. Woman with garden hose, washing the windows. Could this be a metaphor for cubism? Could it be a metaphor for the fact that, oh, and the cubists like to show you multiple sides of an object simultaneously on a flat surface. Makes you see things clearer. Makes you see things better. Just like washing the window. Just saying. This guy <laughs> running his head up against a brick wall. That's right out of a, that's a metaphor in and of itself. And the idea that perhaps some of the things that modernist painting wanted to do was kind of like beating your head up against a brick wall because in sometimes it was frustrating, if not impossible. And then finally, the chicken looking at itself in the mirror. Does he think it's another chicken? Does he understand that this is a reflection? One of the commercials, I hope you've seen this. Liberty Mutual, Limu, e, Emu, and Doug. And they show this Emu and he sees his reflection in a window and starts attacking the window. See, birds do that. They think it's another bird. They think it's some other bird trying to encroach on their territory. And of course, birds, birds are brilliant in some ways. But birds have a very limited understanding as well. And one of the oh epithets that uh, people used to throw around was that if you didn't get something, you weren't quite smart enough, you were a bird brain. You don't talk like that anymore, but the idea is here. Maybe we're just not smart enough. Maybe we don't understand. Maybe we don't understand that we're just looking at ourselves in a mirror and so on. So this is the short history of modernist painting. Bottom line, it's art about art. One of my favorite Mark Tanzi paintings, by the way, The Triumph of the New York School, not in the book. And I want to tell you about this because this is really kind of significant, at least to me. And as somebody who had studied European modernism, and the flight of modernist artists escaping Nazi Germany and coming to New York. I told you some of those stories. And it made New York the center of Western art. It had moved from Rome to Paris and in the mid 20th century, New York was at its center. And so over here, this is so cool. I was a military guy too, so 
over here we got a table set up and it's like they're gonna sign a peace treaty you can see the battlefield and you can see over here those those kind of helmets and especially this and that hat that's all French military uniform stuff. And you can see that they're kind of antiquated. They're on horseback. They have lances. They would be lancers. That's like right out of medieval times. Whereas on the American side of this picture, over here on the right, we got an armored personnel carrier with machine guns and half track they call this bottom line old new and they're signing a peace treaty and if you kind of pick through some of this you would see that this is Henri Matisse this is a picture of Henri Matisse probably the greatest living French painter still in the 1940s. He died in the 50s, but he was world renowned. On this side, we got a kind of an assortment of modern American painters and critics. This is presumably Clement Greenberg, who was a well-known critic and a supporter of all of this abstract expressionism. And these people here are abstract expressionists. Uh, some of them are easily recognizable. There's Jackson Pollock, by the way, right in front. O.C. Barnett Newman over here, right there. Robert Motherwell and so on. So this is the triumph of the New York school. And when that cultural shift occurred, people like Greenberg talked about it in heroic terms. And so it was not uncommon to see the triumph, the victory, the heroism of all of these abstract painters. And so anyway, there's another little footnote here. There's a woman with a camera. Another American photographer, Margaret Bork White. We saw her in the book. And she was a photographer for Life Magazine. And Life Magazine was one of the premier news news outlets or news publishers of the day. Everybody read life at the time. It, it's kind of hard to understand. There weren't any choices. TV wasn't around. So if you wanted to see things, you waited every week for your life magazine. And so anyway, Margaret Bork White was very famous. And she documented so many things. She documented the Tennessee Valley Authority projects and a lot of the WPA stuff in the Great Depression. She documented a lot of World War II things. She was one of the photographers, maybe the photographer, when the Americans liberated the concentration camps in the spring of 1945. And as one of her most noteworthy assignments, Life Magazine sent her to India to document Mahatma Gandhi in, after the war in the late 1940s. And so if you see a lot of history photos from the era, and they're good photos, Margaret Bork White, probably, probably. Anselm Kiefer, Negredo, oil acrylic emulsion slack, straw and photograph on woodcut, mounted on canvas, 
Look at the size of this thing, 10 feet, 10 by 18 feet, two. Anselm Kiefer. This is not so much art about art, but his career really, and you read, if you ever read what he had written, he'll tell you about uh, the difficulty of growing up German after the Second World War. It's all about a national guilt for all of the atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis. Uh, it's about uh, what you would call sins of the father, et cetera, et cetera. And so these huge, huge multi-media, uh, mixed media, I should say, paintings. And they're really about something very personal to him. Uh, Andreas Gursky, Chicago Board of Trade, number two. We're talking about greed is good. It's a photographer, Cibachrome print. Look at this. Looks like a beehive. Looks like something. Looks like insanity. Making a statement. And it's it's for a photo, it's pretty big too. It's almost seven feet tall and almost 12 feet wide. Look at this. Wu Guangzhong. Wild vines with flowers like pearls. So what does this look like? No takers. Could I convince you Jackson Pollock? The drips, the splatters. And so what we start to get at this point, we're kind of going back and forth. I just showed you a German artist, a Chinese artist. And what's happening is that everything's gone viral. Everything's gone global. And so an artist like Wu Guangzhong, Wild Vines with Flowers, he's taken something that, at least on the face of it, looks like a Jackson Pollock painting with all of the drips and the, what they would call these uh, marks of Jackson Pollock. It looked like skines of yard yarn, excuse me, um, which got virtually the same elements. But you get somebody using some of the same techniques, some of the same imagery, if you will, and doing it for an entirely different purpose. And so this is even yet a step further than when I was showing you Kehendi Wiley and doing the Jacques Louis David Napoleon painting or the death of Marat as a guy getting shot in his low rider. And so, and so it's global. And we share this history. We share a lot of things. And it doesn't have to mean the same thing. You can take something and appropriate it, which is kind of the term that's used a lot. And you can use it for your own purposes. There's a Jackson Pollock, just for comparison. There's a Jackson Pollock Lavender Mist and Wu Guangzhong. And so here's Song Tsunam, Summer Trees, ink on paper. And it's kind of actually much smaller. Uh, it's only like 25 inches high, two feet. Summer Trees. 
And this is yet another kind of painting or kind of drawing, if you will, that we saw with Morris Lewis, who did stain painting in the 50s and 60s in the US. And, and so these artists from the other side of the world are seeing what Americans had done, but they're taking the techniques and the imagery for an entirely different purpose. And so there's that Morris Lewis I was talking about, acrylic resin on canvas. And these were called stain paintings. Uh, this ink on paper, but it's what those of you who do ink drawings would consider an ink wash. And again, some of the drips and stuff, the idea of letting the medium come forward. You don't have to hide it. Julian Schnabel, 1985. He was kind of in that early years in the 1980s of being somebody who was pretty much in it to make a lot of money. And so he does things, he's a little different. He, he made a, a statement about attaching, just in the same way, if I could show you this, the same kind of way, oops, that, ah, Anselm Kiefer had been doing. Like this. Straw, emulsion, shellac, mounted on canvas. This is all kind of stuff. Schnabel's doing the same thing. One of the, one of the techniques or one of the media he uses is that he takes plates and glues them onto the surface and paints right over the top. Again, this is another guy. They, there's a documentary on streaming television about him and his career. And so you have a lot of things going on. And some of it reflects on the past, some of it not. But there's this idea that new things, new things are at a premium. Elizabeth Murray, Can You Hear Me, 1984. She's a, an artist, a painter, and she cut these shapes out of wood, you know, what you'd call abstract, paints on them and puts them together. And the idea of the shape painting, the shaped canvas, if you will, um, that's not new, we saw this before, but she's taking this to yet another level. And so it's like in this area that is both painting and sculpture. And that's kind of a, a significant idea, a significant breakthrough, if you will, because during the abstract expressionist days, there was a lot of argument about what was pure painting and what was pure sculpture. And people like Clement Greenberg went so far as to say that sculpture should not be painted. It just should display the materials from which it's made. It shouldn't be covered up. And painting, on the other hand, should be flat, which is why you got Morris Lewis and Jackson Pollock. It's, and so on and so on. But this is taking, taking a new route. Helen OG, Mount St. Helens. You see, this is a shaped canvas too. Roplex, anybody know what Roplex is? It's kind of a big thing in the 80s. It's, uh, it's basically the, the stuff that acrylic paint is made of. It's like acrylic paint without 
pigment. It's just liquid acrylic. And they call it Roplex. And so anyway, but it gives the paint a lot of texture. Mount St. Helens, this is, you guys don't know, in 1980, Mount St. Helens, a volcano in Washington State blew up. It erupted and it was a major disaster. It was one of the biggest volcanic eruptions ever in the United States. So anyway, that's what this is. And if you look at it, you can see it. But on the other hand, very painterly. It's got a lot of color. It's just it's a shaped canvas. It's Yayoi Kusama sitting in a wheelchair in front of a selection of her acrylic on canvas paintings. So look at this. New and different. And you could probably kind of look at this and say, well, okay. Keith Haring did a lot of cartoons, toony kind of stuff. And that's kind of what this is. It is very different. And it's very personal. What you would call idiosyncratic. It is unique to the individual. And so what she's created is her own visual language her own color combinations, her own imagery. You see, some of these you can actually start to pick out. You see those faces down here. And there's other little places where there's imagery, but in some of this, it looks like it was more inspired by looking through a microscope or something. The eyes have it. And so anyway, that's, Really what's happening, it's happening all over the globe. Everybody is kind of doing their own thing. We call this time post-modernism because modernism kind of played itself out. As I talked to you before about modernism and the emphasis on the new, it was that's still a value, but it's kind of not the same. It's about the individual and the individuals where you get the newness, not from going more abstract, not from developing new techniques, although that may be part of it. The idea is that the artist becomes central and they do different things, and it's hard to put them into a movement, even though we communicate better and than any time in the past. It's still about the individual and not following the crowd. And as I started this talking to you about graffiti, that's kind of where a lot of this started and everybody else kind of doing things pretty much in their own way. Now you can take cubism and see a bunch of artists who kind of take the ideas of cubism, kind of play with them a little bit and they all look like Picasso. You can take abstract expressionism and a lot of that stuff looks alike but by abstract expressionism, that was one of its downfalls, is that the artists started developing their own idiosyncratic styles, was termed signature styles. And so inevitably, the individual comes out and we're all, we're all very different and we're all picking ideas from each other in this age of mass communication. And see, this is not that long ago, not even 10 years. Um, Kimio 
Sutiya. Symptom, 1987. And so this is like a modernist sculpture, but made from what you would say, natural materials, branches. And so that's kind of a thing too. I mean, there are other artists that do similar sorts of things, I gotta say, Andy Goldsworthy being one. But the idea of taking something that in a previous era would have probably been a steel welded sculpture and doing it with natural materials. El Anatsui, somebody actually, there, I was talking to some people today, there's a gallery on the Central West End and they're supposed to in the near future have some of his work. El Anatsui, Bleeding Takari 2, 2007. Aluminum bottle tops and cans. This guy, this guy takes materials that would be discarded. It's almost like he mines the landfills. And so you see these aluminum bottle tops and they're cut, they're polished, and typically it says, and copper wire. This is all tied together with little bits of copper wire. Look at the size of this, 12 feet high, 18, 19 feet long. And there's your bottle tops and this other aluminum cans. Cut them up, turn them inside out. You got some, some paint, it doesn't talk about that here. But bottom line is that making art from basic, ordinary stuff. And so this guy, El Anatsui, is doing that. There were a lot of artists doing that. And, and some of them came out of Italy, by the way. And they termed this kind of art, arte povera, which meant poverty art and it's what you make art out of when all you have is detritus junk stuff from the landfill waste and turn that into something like a large what is it uh, essentially a large quilt made out of aluminum bottle tops and cans amazing And you can see that some of the ideas pr probably were inspired by Western art, but it's a whole different kind of thing. It's global. El Anatsui, international artist extraordinaire. Another area that artists explore is video. And so it's kind of odd that I'm showing you still pictures of video, but that becomes a medium too. It's, uh, and as you can see, the chairs, the table turned upside down. Adrian Piper, corner. Show you this, Bill Viola, the crossing. Video sound display with two channels of color video 16 feet high. A lot of this stuff like Bill Viola's uh, stuff, it'll be shown in a dark room in a gallery. And it's got all of the, it's like a mosh pit or something. All of the sound just hits you. It's overwhelming. Uh, the large projector video sound display, two channels of color video. So you got both of them coming at you. Why not? And Viola would talk about this as um, being like a painting. In fact, 
when he talks about making his work, he bases much of this on painting, except it moves and, and it has sound. And it typically does not tell a story like, like a movie would, but it's just a video audio experience. And you can find some of this stuff on YouTube, by the way. Uh, Tony Orsler, this was kind of interesting. Uh, ceramic glass video player, video cassette, projectors. These things here, they're like, they are ceramic shapes. They look like eggs, almost. They're clean, they're polished, they're white. And he takes these little projectors and projects faces on them. And he also has, like it says, video cassette player and stuff. You see how old it is. Bottom line, sometimes these things would talk. They look like little heads. You know, he had one where he had some of these underneath a blanket. And the, <laughs> these little heads were saying, let me out of here. <laughs> Funny, it's all get up. But at any rate, new, different. Give me a new medium. Installations. Jenny Holzer, truism. This is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Guggenheim in New York City. And she, she is an artist who uses message boards. I don't see that so much anymore, but back 30 years ago, that was like high tech. And so she just, that's her art. And her art is, she calls those truisms, inflammatory essays. And so, yeah, they, they have some kind of moral. Monomania is a prerequisite of success. Men are not monogamous by nature. No expectations are good protection, etc. Language, art, technology, everything exploding. Uh, Matthew Barney, Cremasters. Uh, this is this guy is pretty interesting too. This is the same museum, and he's got all of these artifacts hanging here. But here is. Matthew Barney, and what he does is these performances that are broadcast, well, this was before YouTube, but kind of like on YouTube videos. And what he did, he had this thing where it was kind of a real gender bender. You couldn't tell, he would do these things with some degree of nudity, but you can see here, he looks like uh, he's got a woman's body, but you know, on other ones, men's bodies, things. And so, yeah, this is an installation. Zhu Bing, a book from the sky. Look at this. Woodblock printed books at the Elvium. You guys don't know where the Elvium is? It's the museum at the University of Wisconsin. My studio was right there. Anyway, University of Wisconsin, Madison, 1991. Installation. So the artists use their materials, but uh, take up the whole space. And the space becomes part of the work. Uh, David Hammond's public enemy installation at the MoMA. Got everything going here. Sandbags, looks like a war zone, police line, got balloons. Something just total different. Got these old photos of sculptures, photos of warriors on horseback and stuff. Anyway, vending machines. Again, Terra Donovan, styrofoam cut 
cups in hot glue. Think about sculpture. Sculpture is about light, it's about space. And what this is, by being an installation, it actually is kind of overwhelming. Jehovah. Big crack. Earth art. I'm kind of going fast, but I just want to give you a taste. Andy Goldsworthy. That was the guy I was comparing to just a moment ago. Uh, cracked rock spiral. Earth art. And a lot of these artists talk about moving back to the earliest known artworks produced by humankind. It's what we find, cairns. Oh, you know, uh, Christo and John Claude use a lot of plastic. Put this around. What they did was wrap things in so surrounded islands, Biscayne Bay, which is in Miami. Um, they did uh, wrapping and, and stuff like that, large scale, earth art. What they got their jets cooled a little bit though. After too many projects like these, what they found was that blocking the sunlight from the sea life underneath was very detrimental. In fact, these things were an environmental hazard. So you don't see that so much anymore. And they've gone on to do different kinds of things. My Lin, Vietnam Veterans Memorial, Earth Art, Earth Plays, quite a big role in this. If you look at this from above, it's like this big black granite V Vietnam. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. It almost like it took a slice out of the earth, which I think metaphorically the Vietnam War did to our consciousness. Rachel, Rachel White, White Reed, it's hard to say that. Um, oh, I want to show you this because this is the last of it. Tilted Ark before its removal. And this is in New York. We have Richard Serra right here in town. Uh, this is it by, it's by the courthouse, by civil courts. You can see it right there. So right on the west side of Keener Park, Richard Serra. Anish Kapoor is probably one of the most enjoyable, most well appreciated, big, large, modern, postmodern sculpture. Call it, it's called Cloud Gate, but it's in Chicago. It's right by the Art Muse Museum, the Art Institute rather. And it's stainless steel and it's highly polished. And they call it the Big Bean. And it's a tourist attraction. Look at the fun people are having interacting with this. Millennium Park, Chicago. Um, I'm going to run this out. We'll talk. We'll pick up next time. I do want to uh, get to something else here. And let give me a second here.
Oh, well, I can't get to what I want to get to. Yeah, this is the screen we're on. Um, well, and it's kind of late. I don't know if I can get to this. I wanted to show you, I put a quiz up. Quiz five, it's on the assignments. And that means you've got two things to do actually pretty soon. Uh, the group presentation and quiz five. Now on the assignment page for the group presentation, I put one of the group presentations, the video recording that I got last semester and it's about Stonehenge and it's, it's a pretty good one. It's uh, about the right length. The members of the group go back and forth talking about their art or the art that they're reporting on. And um, they bring up a lot of good evidence. It's got a bibliography at the end. It's a fine example. And the quiz question is about how today's artists use art from the past in their art. And so we've been talking about that. Uh, take a look at the assignments page. That's where you can find all of this stuff. And Zoom does not like me changing applications. If I stay on, if I stay on PowerPoint, it'll be okay. But once you start going back into Canvas, uh, don't do that. Anyway, questions. No questions. Well, if you come up with some you got my email. And so have a good weekend. Happy art history. I'll see you on Monday. Bye. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You bet, Robin.